Welcome to the WordPress Photography Podcast, the podcast for photographers who want to learn how to get the most out of WordPress to grow their photography business. You don't need to be a geek to understand WordPress. Settle back and listen as we show you how. Now, here's your host, Scott wyden Kivowitz. Ever since buying a digital camera, I can only think of its positive points. There aren't any negatives. Welcome to episode 87. My name is Scott Weidenkiewicz, and I'm joined by my guest, Eric Rosenberg. Eric is a finance and travel and technology writer in Ventura, California. He is a former bank manager, a corporate finance and accounting professional who left his job in 2016 to take his online side hustle full time. He has in-depth experience writing about banking, credit cards, investing in other financial topics, and is an avid travel hacker, which I'm, a, I'm kind of into a little bit. Um, <laughs> when, when away from the keyboard, Eric enjoys exploring the world, flying small airplanes, discovering new craft beers, and spending time with his wife and little girls. You can connect with him here and uh, at Personal Profit, Profitability his or his uh, personal branded site, Eric Rosenberg. So, welcome, Eric. Finally, to have you on the show. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so, for everybody listening, I have been trying to get Eric on for a while. Uh, things happened, as you heard in the last couple episodes, with uh, the water damage in my home studio. So, um, but we're now here, and we're now recording. And this is going to be a good episode. This is going to be a, a whole topic about finances for photographers and a, a variety of, of uh, things even deeper than that. So I know it's a topic that not a lot of photographers like thinking about or talking about or even wanting to handle. But if you have a photography business, this is something you have to think about and have to do. So um, Eric is going to be great at um, breaking things down, simplifying it and making them more enjoyable than just thinking about finances. So <laughs> it's will be good. Um, That's my well, goal. <laughs> yeah. So before we dive in, uh, Eric, what is going on with you? What is new? What do, you, what do you have in the pipeline? Things like that. Yeah, this has been a busy travel year for me so far. I actually just got back from my 12th trip of the year. As everyone's listening to this, I was just at FinCon. That's a big financial blogging and media conference I go to every year. <laughs> And that's actually got what got me started in this online world. So I'm a huge fan of FinCon and everything that happens there. I've also been I've been all around the world. As you mentioned, I'm a big travel hacker. So I go to conferences. I've been on some personal fun trips, actually. I'm still recovering from a conference right now. So my voice sounds <laughs> a little funky. But yeah, a lot of travel, a lot of good things. You know, I've been keeping my head down working on my own business. I have a, a boot camp I'll tell you guys about later that I'd love to share um, that, that I have that came out. Well, not too long ago, that helps people like you, hustlers and entrepreneurs, learn to level up their business. So that's what I'm all, all about, really. So I'm actually just, this conference I just got back from, I spoke on a topic very related to what we're going to talk about today. I just had a twist for online finance bloggers and podcasters. So same topic, just switching it up for photographers, because a lot of what we do, uh, believe it or not, is very similar. You know, it doesn't matter if you're running a little solo photography business or a multi-million dollar online empire or a fortune 500 company a lot of the basics are are the same you know they might have a few more zeros at those big <laughs> yeah, companies than we do as few. solo business owners <laughs> but but the basics are the same and that's what i used to do for a living was was corporate finance and accounting so yeah i'm excited to be here and and dive in with photography maybe i'll pick up a few tips about how to fix my aperture on my camera while we're going <laughs> <laughs> nice um, so, you know, finances, uh, everything starts with keeping track of everything, You're the bookkeeping aspect. So can you talk about the importance of it um, and, and really how do you do your bookkeeping? Uh, what, what's the proper way, really, to do your bookkeeping and things like that? Yeah, well, that's a great question and a great starting place because you know, bookkeeping is really just categorizing. You know, I'm going to try to not use finance jargon today, and I'm going to use words that like normal people think. <laughs> yeah. So when you hear a term like chart of accounts, that is something I worked on a lot in my corporate accounting time. Chart of accounts is really fancy words for categories. So what we're doing with bookkeeping 
is we're taking a look at every transaction that has come through our bank account or our credit card. And it's very important you have separate bank accounts for your business than you do personally, Mm -hmm. even if you run your business as a sole proprietor. So even if you don't register with your state saying, you know, I am Mr. Photographer or Mrs. Photographer or Miss Photographer, wherever you fall on the photographer spectrum, um, you don't have to register with your state to be considered a business. All you have to do to be a business in the eyes of the IRS, uh, if you're here in the U.S., is make money. And so uh, that's that's really all that matters, what the IRS thinks, right? <laughs> so um, and one thing to keep in mind as we're going through this, there are a lot of benefits for you um, that will come because you did this later on. I mean, no one ever said, I ignored my finances and they just fixed themselves. Like, that's just That's not the way the world works. So bookkeeping is the first step in just knowing where you're at. It's um, just like if you use something like Mint.com or Personal Capital or or there's a whole bunch of different personal finance apps that can help you track all your bank accounts and credit cards and loans in one place. You should do the exact same thing for your business. So doing that, it's what we call accounting software, bookkeeping software. Uh, The one I use is called QuickBooks. That's the biggest one out there. It's from a company called Intuit. They actually also make TurboTax and mint.com so they're they're the big one in the industry but they're definitely not the only one right. among solo business owners fresh books is really popular because it's it's a lot slimmer it really just focuses on the things that you would probably need where quickbooks works for pretty much any kind of small to mid-sized business it has things like inventory and you know, all, all sorts of things that you might not need so fresh books is a little lighter and there's another one called Zero. That's X E R O. That's really popular. I was I, at their I, conference about a month ago. I believe yeah. that uh, when I was first uh, starting my business, and I, I, I went with QuickBooks, so I've been using QuickBooks for for years. But um, I think I tried Wave. Was it W just W A V at Wave. one point? And I if, yeah. I, if I recall correctly, when you set it up, it even asked what type of business you are, and if you put photography, mm-hmm. it actually special you know uh, adjusted its it's categories for photographers. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I, I know is QuickBooks cool. did it, but QuickBooks did the same thing, but it wasn't as uh, fine-tuned for photography as Wave was. But anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> Wave. Yes. Yeah, so Wave is a great. I'm glad you brought that one up. So Wave is free, where all the others that I mentioned cost money. Um, but there's a reason I pay money to use one every month. So right. <laughs> there's no. Sometimes with free, you get what you pay for. Wave yeah. is is good. It will definitely meet your minimum needs. Um, But me, with accounting experience, I wanted a little bit more power. I wanted to be able to tinker more. Uh, And I think the people who built these programs, QuickBooks was probably built more with accountants in mind. Mm -hmm. So if you feel less accountant-y, maybe something like FreshBooks or Wave might be easier for you. But I'd check them all out and see what fits for you because what's really most important, like I said, you can't ignore it. What's important is you pick one that you're really going to use. And it doesn't matter... Uh, which one it is, as long as you use it and you update your stuff every month. That's the schedule I'd recommend for everybody. You know, when you're a corporate accountant, the busiest time of the month is what we call month end close. And um, that's the first few days of the month where you look back and say, here's everything that happened last month. We write it down in our accounting records. That's called you know, recording a transaction or for our purposes, categorizing. <laughs> and uh, then you're off with your financial reports. So what's really cool about any of these apps that I just mentioned is they will link to your bank account or your credit card. And you can click one button and all of your transactions will just show up in your bookkeeping app. So all you have to do at that point is click and assign categories. So maybe you know, if you're a digital photographer only, you don't use any film, your uh, equipment might be computer hardware photography, hardware and equipment, like lenses, things like that. You'll want to have categories for each of those. So at the end of the year, you can look back and say, oh, here's how much I spent on cameras. And then on the other side, you'll do the same for income. You know, maybe you do different types of events. So you'll have a breakout for weddings and bar mitzvahs or a breakout for um, nature photography that you sell online, stock photography. There's all sorts of different ways you can make money as a photographer. So what's important to you is to differentiate how you make money so you can look back and say, here's what's working well and here's what's not working well in my business. Because if you maybe you really want to be a stock photographer, maybe you think that's like the best way to make a living. 
Um, you get to you know, live like um, like Hank Moody did in Californication and just like wake up whenever you want and have this crazy party lifestyle <laughs> that a, and that not a have a boss. Show. That was such yeah, a good it show. Was like, it was a fun show, right? Yeah, it's it like was. that's like the lifestyle you want. But you realize looking at your books, you make yeah. 15 times more doing weddings and bar mitzvahs. And maybe that's not the thing you wanted to do. Maybe that's not what's exciting to you. But if it's what's working... The numbers tell you the story and you have to pay the bills, right? I mean, I'm, a, I'm a writer. I'm a creative just like you guys. We're all artists and we, we want to think that we can be above money or our, our craft is so special, but we have to pay our rent or our mortgage. We have to eat. We have to have clothes. So by looking at what's working in your business, you can focus on those areas. And then once you've mastered those and you're getting the best results, then you can go back to the things you want to do in your business more, which might not be as profitable, but because you know you have your profitable side covered, you have that freedom. Um, let me ask you something. Uh, I record in QuickBooks. Uh, I well, the way I use the like the import from my bank account, so I don't have to like manually do it. I just import the, and then I then I can uh, categorize and everything. I have a reminder on my calendar the first of every month to do my my business finances. Is that the ideal time to do it, or should I wait a few days for potential changes that come into the account? Like, is is the first okay, or should you yes, wait till the was, third, fourth, something like that? So, if it were me, I'd probably wait till around the third or fourth because of exactly what you said. If you have, maybe you use uh, an online invoicing service that. You have a client invoice payment coming through and whatever payment system you use, like something cool about QuickBooks is invoicing and payments are built in. Mm -hmm. They don't all have that built in or and you do have to pay a little extra for payments with QuickBooks or any payment processor probably. But maybe you have a payment that's made on the 30th of the month and you will get that on the 31st, but it doesn't show up on your account yet until the first. You know, if you have that that's just one timing scenario where in your case it would work on the first you catch it but what if it's a credit card payment it takes a couple days to show up if you update your books on the first you are looking back at last month's books and they're not complete you're missing right. an income or an expense right. so th what i do is what i'd recommend for most people when you get your bank statement in the mail or email whatever however you get it it's usually around the seventh ish tenth ish of the month uh, for most banks because they take they have to have all those transactions processed, like we were just saying, there's system delays, and then they'll make your statement, send it out to you. So once you have that statement, you know your books are locked or your accounts mm -hmm. are locked, nothing is going to change going backward. Right. So I, I mean, I'm kind of a weirdo because I love finance and money. I'll <laughs> update mine about once a week or maybe even more. But at the, the time that's most important is that one about a week after the end of the month. You get make sure everything from the prior month is categorized right. And then here's actually a little a little accounting 101. I call this kind of step five in a four steps of how to be an accountant for your own business process. I give a little talk on that. So the last thing you need to do after you've you know, picked your bookkeeping software, imported your transactions, categorized them, the last step is called reconciliation, which is a really scary word, but it really just means comparing my bank statement to my accounting to make sure they match. And if you use one of the online ones, like with QuickBooks Online, I click a button and it will do it by itself and right. just tell me if there's a difference. And if there's a difference, I can usually look at my bank statement and figure out, oh, there's one transaction missing. Uh, but the reason you do that is at the end of the year, you're going to use these. Well, well there, there's two reasons. So one, you're going to use it for taxes. And if you over report your income and um, then you're paying too much taxes and if you under report your income then you're paying too little and that's a crime so you want to do it right and i don't I've, i'm not one to recommend underpaying taxes i think you should just follow the rules do it by the book um, you know, lower your taxes as much as you can legally but that's also part of why we're doing this because as a business if you're profitable you can deduct expenses which lowers your taxable income so i'm going to try to simplify that a little because I know it's a lot of big words. So let's say you make uh, $50,000 a year as a, with your photography business all in and you spend $10,000 a year on gear and hosting and websites and business cards and marketing and ev everything 
all in. Maybe you, you pay for insurance for yourself through your business, all, all kinds of things. So at the end of the year, $40,000 of what you made is profit, even though you brought in 50000 in revenue. So the IRS, as an individual, you don't have to worry about this. You just pay taxes on what your paycheck says. But when you own a business, you have to say, oh, do I pay taxes on the 50000 or the 40000 And because you made money, because you were profitable, you only pay taxes on the 40000 You can deduct the expenses. That's what a deduction right. means. So that's part of why we're doing this every month. So at the end of the year, you get every single possible deduction because if you bought a $1,000 lens – and your tax rate bracket is 25%, if you forget to write that down in your books, that's $250 off your taxes that you, you missed out on. So it's really important. I'd rather have $250 than give it to the government, I know, personally. Oh, yeah. I, think oh, yeah. that, I think that transcends political yeah. parties and opinions. <laughs> so that's, that's part of why it's really important to track this stuff. And the yeah. second reason, other than taxes, is what we were talking about, knowing what's working in your business. You know, when an example of that, when I was three months into full-time self-employment, I just quit my job. I'm like any good, good job with, or like, like any good smart dad with a six-month-old daughter and a stay-at-home mom wife. I'd quit my job, sold my house, and moved to Southern California, one of the most expensive parts of the country. So I was very focused on my numbers and my books. And three months in, I was thinking, geez, based on that, the projections I had done from when I was doing this as a side hustle, from when I was doing it part time, I thought I'd be making about two to three times what I was, what I had made part time when I went full time, because you know, about two to three times the hours. But I wasn't seeing that. I was making more, definitely, but not at the rate I thought. So I looked at my books and I was staring at them because I'm a numbers guy, and, that, and that's just. I guess I, I guess that's a curse and a gift, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> yeah. And I was staring at the numbers, and I noticed something, just doing quick mental math. Part of my business, I was doing website development, and that made me about 15 17% of my income. And part of my business was freelance writing, and that made me about 76% of my income. But I was spending about 20% of my time on writing, and about 80% of my time on website development. So if you caught those numbers there, that's almost exactly the 80-20 rule. If you've heard of the 80-20 rule or Pareto's principle, who just smacked me in the face and said, Eric, like here's your 80-20. So I quit doing the website development work, started doing writing full-time only, and that, that meant walking away from a profitable business that was making me money. But over that next three months, my income roughly tripled to over $10,000 a month for the first time ever. And it has only dipped back below that twice in over three years. So the story that I got from my accounting books, and yeah, they're numbers, but there's really a story in there. And that's the story of your business and how well you're doing and what's working and what's not. So that's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing our bookkeeping and doing all these little sometimes kind of boring technical things, <laughs> categorizing our yeah. transactions, because that gives us the information we need to make the best decisions to succeed in our business, however we want to do that. You know, one of the things that I like about QuickBooks, uh, especially if you import from the bank, is it automatically looks at the transaction and can can give you a, a, a suggested category for that transaction. And you can edit it. And not only can you edit it, but you can edit it and say, for all future transactions for this, you know, if it's the same, you're buying from, like my, MailChimp, right? For yes. me, it, it automatically categorizes dues and subscriptions every month, right? Um, For me, it's convert kit. Same thing. Yeah, <laughs> with yeah. Our email list. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. So I have domain names. I have a thing set up that if it ever yeah. says Google domains, that's who I use, or, yeah. or GoDaddy. It'll yeah. auto categorize. They're, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. I'll go to a restaurant and it'll show up as travel, or I'll go to. Um, I mean, who knows? You know, some kind of purchase might yeah, show up in you know, the category. So I find good so so it's I have good. yeah. So I have uh, I have you know like food as if like a like if I take a client out right for for coffee or for for lunch or something like that. I have that as a category. But then I have travel food if I'm out traveling for for a, at a trade show or something like that. Um, so sometimes if I travel and I come back and then I go to a restaurant here, that's as travel food. Like I feel like. Um, QuickBooks, it learns from you, but sometimes it's not smart enough to realize, you know, 
it's it, it's smart, but it's not perfect. It's not a <laughs> it's not an AI yet. Yeah, yeah, yet. yeah. <laughs> the machine learning is in there, but yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's good yeah. that you brought that up. Also, that distinction between taking a client to a coffee versus getting a coffee if you're on the road at a conference or traveling for work, because yeah. there could be different tax rates for those. Yeah. So you know every type of expense for your business, that's the kind of thought process you should have. You know, how does this affect my business? You know, if you're uh, driving a lot for, for, for client work or for any kind of, um, kind of business purpose, you want to track your miles. That's another category you could track. Even if you're not deducting the gas, the IRS lets you write off yeah. A certain it's about fifty cents a mile ish. It changes every year. <laughs> it goes up a little bit, but I, all I, these things you track because it saves you on your taxes yeah. and helps you run your business. I do have I do have a suggestion for any photographers who do want to start tracking your miles, which I do recommend. Uh, there's a device called Automatic, and you literally plug it into the computer of your car, where where the uh, a mechanic would plug in to, to diagnose, you know, the computer. You plug it in. You just leave it plugged in, and it uses cell networks to track your car at all times, which has two two benefits. One is you can literally track your car at all times. <laughs> you know, like you can if you I park somewhere. I have one of those. I have the original version, so um, the, the old automatic. They're yeah. they're super cool. Yeah. yeah, and then the other one, the other advantage is you could also um, mark out a trip as business. So. I, I can literally log into Automatic's website and export everything that I did that was business, and have and give that to my accountant at the end of the year, and you know, uh, or tax get your time. fifty cents a mile. Yeah. yeah. Another yeah. another app that'll do that that doesn't involve buying the device for your car is called Mile IQ. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it used to be independent. Now it's owned by um, a company that it's Microsoft. <laughs> at the end of the day, but. Uh, yeah, they do a good job, and I think they have a free version, which for most independent photographers would be plenty for everything yeah. you need. It, it does it just what you said. It'll track when you drive around. You just tap a button that says, oh, that was work. Yeah. Um, you know, what I, way that I do it myself, yeah. I know I, I fly a lot for work. I, mm -hmm. you know, I'll go to conferences around the country. I've mentioned a few. Um, so I fly out of Burbank or Santa Barbara or LAX for each con, depending on where I'm going and what the best flight deal was. So I actually have a spreadsheet because, you know, again, used to be an accountant. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I tally each time I have a trip to the airport. So I put in my spreadsheet. I know from my house to LAX and back is X miles, you know, right. 110 miles or something. So if I have five LAX trips for work every year, you know, I can put a five there. And there, that's another way to estimate. So if you yeah. haven't been tracking perfectly, um, you, you can still go back use Google Maps or something and figure out how far trips were for work purposes. You can still claim those. And, I, you know, I, I, I might be wrong in saying this as well, but uh, you don't have to be, like, exact. You know, it's not like the government's going to come and look at your, your, your odometer every, every month. Like, you don't have to be 100% exact. If you can round. Miles off, yeah, you can round. <laughs> so. when, I was, when I was in corporate finance, I was on job, I was in uh, financial planning and analysis, or FP&A, on product lines that were over a billion dollars, we so us a million dollars was a rounding error. So like if the IRS, they really don't care about five ten bucks. They want if it's a few thousand, they care. Yeah. But yeah. they they really care if your photography gig was thirty miles away or thirty four miles away. As long as you know, just guess your do your best guess. <laughs> uh, before before we move on to the next topic, I. I I just want to say one more thing that I really like about QuickBooks that uh, really sold me on QuickBooks. Uh, as somebody who's deep in the WordPress space, and uh, I used to work at an IT security company, so I'm quite paranoid about security. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I want you to look at my house now. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm, a, I'm a techie nerd. I have stuff all over. I'm <laughs> firewalls on my firewalls. <laughs> Good. So, so the the two things I really like about about uh, QuickBooks. Uh, one is two-factor authentication, so it has that. But I know that like FreshBooks would have that and other you know, companies would have that. But the thing that really uh, makes me happy is they have accountant access. So I don't have to give my accountant my login credentials. I literally add their email address, their account, to my QuickBooks, and they have access to certain things as an accountant. They can do what they need to. a little uh, perk of that if you do hire an accountant. So that, that's one other thing that I... I'd say so. I think most people, if you are smart enough that you have built a business around photography and you are here listening to this show and trying to improve, 
you are probably a person who could do this all yourself in an hour or less per month. I firmly believe that most people can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is no shame in hiring an accountant. I've thought about hiring an accountant, even though I used to be an accountant, just to save time. Uh, just because yeah. I'm busy and even though I could do it myself, I could pay someone else to do it you know, right off that cost and it would just be done for me. Um, the one that I've looked at would be $150 a month. Uh, he's, a, he's a friend of mine and he does just online uh, people like try to who do what I do. Influencers, bloggers, podcasters, YouTubers, that kind of thing. But uh, there are you know, local accountants and online companies, even like Bench. And there's one that I like called eData Quick. They're um, based in the Philippines. So you can kind of outsource your accounting to them and they'll do all the bookkeeping and everything uh, and just send it back to you. And because they're in the Philippines, they're super cheap. Uh, Bench, they're in the US. They do the same thing. They cost more. <laughs> but the, the important thing is that it gets done. Yeah. Uh, this is not something you... Uh, can ignore in your business. I and mean, like, if you remember the movie Dodgeball, it was an awesome movie. <laughs> there was a scene where Peter Lafleur, the, the star, uh, has the, he's in foreclosure at his gym, and the woman from the bank comes and says, "Oh, do you have your bookkeeping records?" And he opens up a closet door, and just boxes of shoe boxes with receipts start falling out. Like that, that does not run a business. That doesn't work. Yeah. You can't do your taxes accurately which i mean that's just a legal issue but that aside <laughs> you can't how do you know if you're doing well with your business yeah. you know, i have um i won't pick on this person by name but somebody <laughs> that i know is starting a business and they had all these clients and they were making revenue but they had never added up their costs so they didn't know if they were profitable or not and they were using their personal bank account so they really had no idea they could have been losing 50 dollars on every gig and had no idea so that's why you have to do this stuff. You just have to know if you're making money. Speaking of, of uh, profit and being profitable, what the heck is a P&L? <laughs> yes, great question. So P&L is a profit and loss statement. If you go to business school, another term for that is income statement. Uh, so the place that you will probably have seen this, or you not probably, you may have seen this before, if you've ever done any investing or bought any stocks, Every public company has to put one of these out. They have to release an income statement. So if you're curious right now and you've never looked at one, you can just you know search online for any big company and the term income statement and you will find it. It's out there. So uh, that's just an example to see what they look like. But for you, and yours might not look like Amazon's or Google or Apple or you know, some giant company. Yours will you know, a, few, a few zeros less. But the basic idea is the same thing. So it's going to be broken down into a couple sections. The top section is revenue. So that's all of the sales you make or all the dollars that come in the door. Uh, then the next section is expenses. So that's you know, anything you buy, anything you spend money on. Then at the bottom, if you ever hear the term the bottom line, here's where it comes from. You subtract all of your expenses from your revenues and the bottom line is your profit. So that's why it's a profit and loss statement. It, and if your expenses are bigger than your revenue, then it's a loss. So hopefully you have a profit statement and not a loss <laughs> statement. Uh, but if, if, if it's a negative number, it means you need to fix something in your business, right? Or, yep. or maybe, maybe you had planned one month that you were going to buy a new camera and a few new lenses and you just know that month is going to be negative and, and that's okay because you planned for it. But you definitely don't want to have negative months that you didn't plan for. Because that's how you got a business. That's <laughs> that, that doesn't work. It's yeah. not sustainable. Yeah. Um, so, uh, pop quiz: Which <laughs> TV show do you like more, Shark Tank or The Prophet? I actually don't have cable, so I don't regularly oh, watch either. Okay. I like Shark Tank a little more, I think. But I, honestly, if so I do watch some reality shows that are I mean, I'm not like a Kardashian fan right. like I like I have a level of trashy shows I can watch but, um, my the ones that I like are like the gold mining one Gold Rush and Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares cuz mm. they're business shows or like Hotel Hell that's another Gordon yeah. Ramsay one so it's kind of the same idea as The Profit just in different industries um, I I think it's really fun to look at different ways companies operate I mean, I guess yeah. that's why I went to business school twice I mean, that's just something I was always interested in 
And when I was a kid playing computer games, I was playing all the sim games and all the tycoon games, trying to build businesses like Lemonade Sand Tycoon, trying to make money. <laughs> uh, so that, to me, that was just always interesting. I, whenever, you know, I have I know, I, sometimes I think it's a disease. Like I go to like even I go to Disneyland or somewhere like that. I don't live too far. Um, and you know, most people are there to have the magical experience. And I'm just looking around trying to see all the places they make money. Like that's just how I look at any anything yeah. where I go. I, I trip over something and I'm like, oh, business idea. It's uh, shiny object entrepreneur syndrome. But I'm I'm totally totally yeah. doing that with like marketing aspect. Like, like why are they doing it that way? Like, <laughs> or like <laughs> like that was a really good idea. You know, like that kind and of. And we got to do it for our own podcasts yeah. and our own businesses. For whether for yeah. whatever business you have, that's another reason I like watching shows like that and. Or even you're know, paying attention like that when I'm out and about at a mall or a, anywhere you're out in public, pretty much. That's not a park. You're, they're trying to make money off you. I was thinking about that with little kids. I'm like, where can I go that is a place that's not about making money off of me for going there? And I came up with the beach and the park. So uh, uh, not that's New Jersey. Not, not in New Jersey. They charge you to get on the beach. Oh, we, have to, we have to pay to park at the beach. We have to, uh, pay, to, park we want... and, we have to pay to park and to get on the beach. <laughs> Wow. Man, that's like yeah. the opposite of California. In California, there's actually a, a state law that you can't own beach or block access to the beach. Hmm. So even by the you know, $5,000 a night hotels in Santa Barbara, there's still public beaches. They have to let you go there. Wow. That would be nice. Oh, man, yeah. New Jersey. <laughs> um, we're, 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 we're friends. New York, New Jersey, California. I feel like we're all... We're all on the same uh, playbooks, right? We're all friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, so my last question to you is for uh, the photographers that are just starting out in their business, even considering making their hobby into a business. Um, and you touched on this briefly when we first started talking. Should photographers uh, register their so, themselves as a business like or at what point should they register themselves as a business and if they do should it be an incorporation an llc what is the ideal um two questions yeah. should they yeah and There's then which a, one yes. and why yeah so that that is a great point and a great question and it is something every business owner needs to think about and the answer actually depends on where you live so there is a point in any business that you would want to register, that's probably going to be the point you can make a full-time living on it. At that point, it doesn't matter where you live, you want to be registered. It doesn't matter if you're an expensive state or a cheap state. But before that point, there's a lot of ifs. Well, what ifs? So if you live, I, I used to live in Colorado. I grew up in Denver. I was in Colorado about 25 years. So I started a few companies when I lived in Colorado. Registering a new LLC in that state was about 50 bucks and every year I think it was $50 and every year It's a $10 fee to keep registered when you file your um, annual form with the state in California The minimum cost is $800 a year if you register a business so if you're making $5,000 a year and you live in Colorado, I would say yes, you should register if you live in California, I would say not yet, but hopefully you'll, you will grow and there will be a point in the future. I mean, in between, I lived in Oregon and there it was, I think, 200 a year to start a business or 200 to start and then 100 to renew. So there at 5,000 a year, it's, it's kind of a tougher decision. You know, is, is it worth that or not? Um, and so is it worth it? So what are the benefits of registering? I guess, why would you put that cost in to begin with? There are two big reasons you would register. So first is legal protections. So if you are a, let's say you do weddings. Uh, weddings is just like an easy photography business to, <laughs> to mm -hmm. pick on. Yep. Um, let's say you do weddings and you are out doing a wedding at um, some beautiful place and you get down on one knee to take a picture. Someone walks up the aisle and one of the bridesmaids trips over your camera bag or your camera strap and breaks their arm. Like, probably was that really your fault? Probably not. I mean, you know, we could argue that you know it was your fault. You shouldn't have been there. We could argue she should have been watching where she was going. Doesn't matter. That kind of thing could happen. It's very unlikely, but it's possible. So what's going to happen in that situation? Maybe they're going to be nice and say, "Oops, I should have been watching where I was going," and they will 
um, have three extra drinks at um, the reception to get rid of the pain in their arm or whatever. But maybe it's a broken arm and they decide to sue you uh, because you were a business provider and you tripped them. So if you are not registered as a business, they are suing you personally. So that means they could go after your house, your retirement account, your bank account, your car, anything. If you are a registered business as an LLC or S Corp, those are the two you would think about as a small business probably. You wouldn't want to be a C Corp, and that's more for startups that are planning to sell stock eventually. Um, Your situations, you would probably want to be an LLC or S Corp. So in either one of those cases, as long as you keep separate bank accounts and uphold what's called the corporate veil, that means not blending your personal and business finances, really running it like a business, if they sue you, they're suing your business, not you in that situation. So the bridesmaid that files the lawsuit, they can go after your business assets. So maybe they can you know, seize your cameras or your laptop or something, anything owned by your business, but they can't go after your house. They can't go after your personal money. Uh, so that's why one, that's the biggest reason most people would want to register early on as to get that protection. And if you have any questions about that, you, know, you can talk to local small business lawyers. They'll probably answer some questions pretty cheap. And you can even file yourself online. I've never, I paid one time a company to do it when I did an S Corp. But all the LLCs, I've done a bunch. I've done myself. And I'm not a lawyer. So, so I did the an other LLC. Reason, y- oh, yeah, go on. Go on. Uh, I was going to say one last thing. I know I'm, this is kind of a long winded answer, but complex questions. <laughs> so um, <laughs> after you hit a point where you're making, Ballpark 35, 40,000 a year, whatever you would, if you hired a photographer to work for you full time, whatever their salary would be, when you make more than that, if you are an LLC that taxes as an S Corp, which that's just a form you fill out, or an S Corp, either way, you can pay yourself a paycheck and you only have to pay self employment taxes, which is like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid taxes that the employer pays, which if you've had a full-time job, you see you pay part and your employer pays part. When you're self-employed, you have to pay both parts. But when you have this S-Corp set up and you are an employee, any income you earn over your paycheck, you don't have to put those payroll taxes on, only your regular income tax rate. So anything over that, you know, 35, 40,000 a year, you pay lower taxes. That's more money in your pocket at the end of the year. So that's, New businesses, don't worry about that. It sounds kind of confusing if you need to talk to an accountant. Um, you know, Again, there's no shame in talking to a professional at least when setting it up. But if you're making more than, you know, say, 35000 40000 a year, seriously, at that point, you definitely should register for that tax benefit plus the legal benefit, I'd say, no matter where you live. End of yeah. long-winded answer. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for uh, not passing out on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did an LLC um, for, for my business here in New Jersey, and uh, they don't charge me to renew every year. It was $150 to register. Uh, I have to pay if I want to ever dis- dissol- uh, dissolve the business. Uh, but the way New Jersey gets you, instead of renewing every year, is you have to submit a annual report, which is really – it's, it's – com- bogus it's like statement yes, of information yes yes you know it's a, that's like, what they're called yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and that was that's like a hundred something dollars so they get you almost the same amount as you did as you paid to register to do this online uh, annual report that takes two seconds to do and they charge you a fortune so and some um, states when you do a statement of information require information from your balance sheet or your pnl so all those those reasons for bookkeeping there's more reasons to do it you know to have that accessible mm-hmm. but yeah but definitely just google you know or whatever your favorite search engine is <laughs> search for your state secretary of state that is where you would file and create a new business entity and that's where you can find out what it costs and there are websites that'll just list out all the costs for you but you know don't feel like you have to pay someone like legal zoom um, you can but you don't have to you can do this yourself what's really important is that you know why or why not you are registering because you know, like like your books you can't just ignore it and assume it'll be right and fix itself you have to take a few minutes because this is your livelihood and if you know god forbid the bridesmaid situation and someone sues you you'll be really happy you had that registration and maybe even insurance in place rather than just operating as a sole proprietor under your own name for sure 
Um, so, so thank you, Eric, for uh, for joining today. We're I'm glad to to finally got you on here, and uh, this was fun. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think you were able to break things down uh, simply for for the average Joe Schmo to, uh, to to understand. So that was great. So thank you for that as well. Um, you can find the show notes from today's episode, where to find Eric, and everything that was mentioned on today's uh, episode at imagely.com slash podcast slash 87. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and wherever you listen to podcasts, including uh, we are now pending at Pandora. So hopefully, um, well, hopefully by the time this goes out, we're approved at Pandora. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I don't know. They just opened the door, so I don't know how long it takes them to approve the podcast. So uh, thank you again, Eric. And uh, until next time. You've been listening to the WordPress Photography Podcast. To listen to other episodes and to subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more, please visit imagely.com forward slash podcast.